In today's Gospel reading, Jesus sends the disciples out on their own, in pairs but without him, to spread his message, and he gives them a packing list. No food, no bag, no money, no extra clothes, only the love and power of Christ and the goodwill of the people they would encounter to support them. The disciples must have felt woefully unprepared, and yet Jesus sent them anyway. As Christians, we may feel unprepared for our journeys. We know that the Lord has sent us out into a broken world to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. But how do we do that? What do we say? What if people don't want to hear the message? Isn't it impolite to discuss religion? Surely the disciples shared these concerns, but they went anyway, trusting Jesus, and in trusting Jesus, they found that his message of repentance and salvation was well received. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. Perhaps this story can serve as inspiration in our own vocations. Although we may not know how to tell others about the love we've found in Jesus, we know that Jesus is supporting us in our meager efforts. We may fear rejection, but Jesus tells us to shake the dust from our feet and carry on. If we worry that we won't get it right, we can remember that the word of God does not return empty. In your baptism, Jesus has called you into his family. In holy communion, he nourishes you for the journey. Throughout your life, he gives you a story to tell others and the power to share his good news. Take courage, Christian, and go forth in his name. He's got your back. everyone. I think my mic's on, yes? Good. I'm Pastor Chris Levesque Hendrick, and I am delighted to be with you this morning. It's been a long time since I've been here. We are in the greening season of the church here. The greening of the world, of course, but the greening also of our faith as we grow and mature and understand ever more God's hope for us, God's desire for us the way we should live. And so, um, welcome to all who are worshiping today. Are there any visitors besides myself? Ah, welcome. Glad to see you. Hope you 
signed in the guest book or uh, whatever it is that is normal here. I'm not sure because I'm just filling in. But uh, it's been, like I said, it's been a long time. I have been here before and it's lovely to be back. Um, I invite you now, as you are able, to stand for the uh, brief order for confession and forgiveness. And it's printed on an insert in your, for your bulletin. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the God of manna, the God of miracles, the God of mercy. Amen. Drawn to Christ and seeing God's abundance, abundance let us confess our sins. God, our provider, help us. It is hard to believe that there is enough to share. We question your ways when they differ from the ways of the world in which we live. We turn to our own understanding rather than trusting you. We take offense at your teachings and your ways. Turn us again to you. Where else can we turn? Share with us the words of eternal life and feed us for life in the world. Amen. Beloved people of God, in Jesus, the manna from heaven, you are fed and nourished. By Jesus, the worker of miracles, there is always more than enough. Through Jesus, the bread of life, you are shown God's mercy. You are forgiven and loved into abundant life. Amen. And now our opening hymn, How Firm a Foundation, number 796. of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. of the whole world for the well-being 
us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Let us pray. God of the covenant, in our baptism, you call us to proclaim the coming of your kingdom. Give us the courage you gave the apostles that we may faithfully witness to your love and peace in every circumstance of life. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. You may be seated for the readings. First reading is from the second chapter of Ezekiel. A voice said to me, O mortal, stand up on your feet, and I will speak with you. And when he spoke to me, a spirit entered into, into me and set me on my feet, and I heard him speaking to me. He said to me, Mortal, I am sending you to the people of Israel, to a nation of rebels who have rebelled against me. They and their ancestors have transgressed against me to this very day. The descendants are impudent and stubborn. I am sending you to them, and you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Whether they hear or refuse to hear, for they are a rebellious house, they shall know that there has been a prophet among them. Word of the Lord. Thank you, God. Here's the psalm refrain for July 7. And for those who read music, you will see that it's slightly modified just to make it a little more singable, but follow along, you'll catch on quick. Our eyes look to you, O God, until you show us your mercy. Let's sing that together. Our eyes look to you, O God, until you show us your mercy. 
To you I lift up my eyes, to you enthroned in the heavens. As the eyes of servants look to the hand of their masters, and the eyes of a maid to the hand of her mistress, so our eyes look to you, O Lord our God, until you show us your mercy. Our eyes look to you, O God, until you show us your mercy. Have mercy upon us, O Lord, have mercy. For we have had more than enough of contempt. Too much of the scorn of the indolent rich and of the derision of the proud. Our eyes look to you, O God. Second reading is from 2 Corinthians, the 12th chapter. I know a person in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up in the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that such a person, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows, was caught up into the paradise and heard things that are not to be told that no mortal is permitted to repeat. On behalf of such a one, I will boast, but on my own behalf, I will not boast, except of my weaknesses. But if I wish to boast, I will not be a fool, for I will be speaking the truth. But I refrain from it, so that no one may think better of me than is what is seen in me or heard from me, even considering the exceptional character of the revelations. Therefore, to keep me from being too elated, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I appealed to the Lord about this, that it would leave me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. So I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities for the sake of Christ. For whenever I am weak, then I am strong. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Jesus came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astounded. They said, where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Then Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honor except in their hometown and among their own kin and in their own house. And he could de do no deed of power there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Then he went about among the villages teaching. He called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, 
but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. He said to them, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. If any place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you as you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. I ask you to pray with me, please. Beloved Lord, grant that the words I speak this day may carry the message you intend for the hearts of your beloved people gathered here in worship, praise, and thanksgiving. Amen. Today's texts from Ezekiel and from Mark's Gospel feel like tough stuff. Both carry a tone of reproach. Nearly six centuries before Jesus, God calls Ezekiel to speak God's own word to a people, God's chosen people, who won't want to listen, who won't want to hear the message. But at least, God says, they shall know there has been a prophet among them. They have been warned. Likewise, Jesus decries the unbelief of his own neighbors, their unwillingness to accept the vital message of God's grace coming as it did from their uppity hometown boy. Prophets are not without honor except in their hometown, he says, amazed at their unbelief. This tone of reproach is what struck me first as I read the text. Where, I asked myself, Am I going to find the good news here? Thankfully, it took only a moment to recognize the graciousness in the ancient word to Ezekiel and in Jesus' words in his hometown. The words to Ezekiel and the alarm bells the prophet later would ring in God's name were now out there for all eternity to be taken to heart or not for all generations to come. Likewise, Jesus' words and his actions were now out there for all eternity to be taken to heart or not for all generations to come. Amazed at their unbelief, Jesus essentially shook off the dust from his own feet as he left Nazareth and moved on to other villages. Further, to cover more ground, that is, to reach more people, with his urgent message, Jesus began to send his disciples off, two by two, penniless and vulnerable, with authority over the unclean spirits, and with power to teach and to heal. Let's go back to Ezekiel. He was a priest among the people who had been taken into exile in Babylon in 587 BC. The exile was punishment to the people of Israel for their many generations of rebellion, for their stubborn refusal to live as God had instructed, choosing instead to go the way of perceived self-interest and their own worldly priorities, especially power and money. But here is the blessing. God did not give up. He raised up a prophet among the people, a man who would continue to speak God's word to them. The blessed kicker in that last verse, whether they hear or refuse to hear, they shall know that there has been a prophet among them, someone to warn them. It is evident that some did hear we know this because now in our own day we are still hearing, still taking into our own hearts this account and all the ups and downs that followed Israel in the years after that and the love-filled warnings they carried. Whether we hear or refuse to hear, ah, that's a matter to be determined. 
And of course, the most vital up in all those ups and downs that followed was the life, teaching, healing, death, and resurrection of Christ Jesus, and the sending of the Holy Spirit to guide us day by day in all our ways, whether we hear or refuse to hear. Ah, and that too is a matter to be determined. A 20th century theologian counseled pastors to prepare their preaching with the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other. By this, of course, he meant that the preacher needed to consider the context in which the people would be hearing the word, the things that would be uppermost in their minds. For example, on the Sunday after September 11, 2001, when the entire world was focused on the terrorist attacks on New York and Washington, preaching had a different focus than it does in our diversely chaotic context today. On this day, July 7th, 2024, there is no singular uniting focus. Rather, it is a world troubled with actual and potential wars abroad and rising hatreds and fears, even here at home, rising coastal flooding around the world as glaciers melt, poverty and starvation, rampant disease, young people in crisis in every country, and so many other issues. In our own country, we are heartbreakingly at odds with one another as to how much and even if these global issues matter to us at all and whether they endanger us directly or not. Within, our, within the country, we are deeply divided on a whole range of additional issues, but including trust in general, how to set priorities, and who should lead. This tangled mess abroad and at home is our large context for today. On this Sunday, gathered as Christians to hear God's word, close on the heels of our Independence Day festivities, it seems right to consider our particular nation and how we might wrestle with its tangible, with its tangle of challenges, founded upon an ideal, however poorly realized sometimes, over its two centuries of plus of life, we citizens are faced with what we may see as competing loves and loyalties. On the one hand, our official leaders have sworn duty to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States. As a retired military officer, I can assure you that my oath of office and the oath sworn by all members of the U.S. Armed Forces adds the words, against all enemies, foreign and domestic. The military oaths also require obedience to the orders of the officers appointed over me, and the military justice code adds lawful orders, specifies lawful orders. On the other hand, Jesus tells us in Matthew's Gospel, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. The heart of the message that comes to me today might be as hard for us to hear with open hearts as were the words from Ezekiel and Mark. Generally, Prophetic words are hard to hear because they threaten established norms and beliefs, and so call for radical rearrangement of priorities, re-examining our assumptions, and new ways of seeing who in the world are our neighbors. Further, if we do, if we do see a difference between our understanding of what Christ teaches and what seems best in our worldly civic life, 
we are in danger of seeing loyalty to nation as more pressing than loyalty to God in Christ Jesus. A story from my military past helped me to see the distinction and how to make choices, and it may be helpful to you as well. A line from an ancient Greek poem, later used by a 17th century English poet, speaks of how one sort of love and loyalty nourishes and enriches another. The line in question comes from a soldier to his beloved. It speaks both of love for a woman and of devotion to country. The line is addressed to the beloved woman and reads, I could not love thee half so much, loved I not honor more. Hear those words again. I could not love thee half so much, loved I not honor more. The honor referred to was not prideful, self-aggrandizing, medal-seeking honor, but rather the commitment to serve the nation with utter devotion, without reservation. The soldier intended to serve his country with all the courage he could muster, with the humility to recognize that he could not know in advance the outcome of even his best actions, and to serve with gratitude and love for all that his country provided for his life and well-being. The poet tells his beloved that his mindset of devotion to nat nation taught him the very nature of love, made possible, honest, and true, that other love, his love for her. I first heard this beautiful poetic line decades ago during my Air Force year years, quoted by a retiring senior military officer at his farewell dinner with his beloved and understanding wife proudly by his side. I've thought of it often in recent years, but from a different perspective, which I would like to share with you today. As I borrow that line, the sense of the words does not change, but the references are different. Consider this reframing, which I offer to you. My dear America, I could not love thee half so much, loved I not the honor of my Lord and Savior more. Precious country of mine, my love for you with all your virtues and all your flaws flows from the love which God defined from earliest times and taught me in Christ Jesus, the nature of love. It is also a love which speaks truth, hailing virtue and compassion wherever they flourish, and condemning evil wherever it shows its ugly, cruel, indifferent, judgmental, greedy head. My dear America, I could not love thee half so much Loved I not the honor of my Lord and Savior more. I believe it is vitally important that we recognize that these two loves, God in Christ Jesus and our precious nature, nation, are not one and the same. Often, thank goodness, the declared values and priorities are indeed the same but they are all too often poorly realized or not available to all. This is what I, might, I believe might be a little hard to hear. The vital message in our context today for us as Christian believers is just this. When God's values and priorities conflict with the more worldly, expedient, 
or so-called practical approaches to the problems of our nation, our loyalty to God must be, at the very least, the starting point for resolving the dilemma, must be, at least, the starting point for resolving the dilemma. If we do not keep clear in our minds that God and nation are separate loyalties and that God and God's vision for the world come first and shape the second, we are in danger of destroying what is best about our country through our disobedience to the call of God. So here is the blessed good news for us today. Down through the ages, God has not given up on us. He has spoke, spoken through prophets in every age and every land, not only in biblical times. Though many refused to hear, and so many still refuse to hear, countless others listened and do now listen with love, gratitude, and humility, and so made in the past and make in our times decisions that bless millions. Think not only of the prophetic voices of Ezekiel and Jesus and Paul, but also of those throughout history who have taken God's vision seriously and have drawn from the ancient prophets to speak truth to power and consolation and hope to the weary and the suffering. For in biblical terms, a prophet is not a fortune teller. A prophet is one who has been inspired by the Holy Spirit of God to speak God's own message, never the prophet's own. Thus says the Lord God, the prophets were instructed to say to the people after they gave warning. With God's eyes, then, the prophet sees into the future, drawing on the past to see the trajectory, the direction, the road of a people, a nation, or the world. The work of the prophet is to provide the gift of truth to those who need to hear it, to provide warning of danger when a people is off course, and to provide a word of divine hope when all seems lost. Over the millennia since Christ walked among us, many prophets have been sent to carry out the message of Jesus. And by God's grace, leaders in high places and low have been willing to take the divine message into their hearts and make God-centered decisions, many at the cost of their lives, or at least their personal well-being. In these turbulent times in our nation and in the world at large, it is vital that we all take on the mindset of a prophet. It is time to recall that the greatest troubles and evils, especially in our fast-paced recent centuries, have come when leaders and people have been unwilling to hear. So now it is our time to listen closely to the teachings of God in Christ Jesus as we make even our ordinary civic decisions. God has not given up on us. God continues to warn us when we stray and to strengthen us when our courage fails or when we're confused and when we are tempted away from God's vision, guided by God's Holy Spirit, may we humble ourselves truly to hear God's message for ourselves and for the healing and hope of our troubled nation and world. Amen. i
forgiveness, comfort, and joy. Help us to be faithful, standing steadfast, walking in your precepts, led by your word. Listen, listen, God is calling, through the word inviting. Let us now confess our faith using the ancient words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father uh, Almighty, Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. earth. I, I believe in Jesus Christ, Christ God's, God's only Son, Son, our Lord, who was, was conceived by the Holy Spirit, Spirit born of the Virgin Mary, Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was, was crucified, and died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We continue with our prayers, and I invite you to be seated, because I think we listen and take them into our hearts better when we do that. So please be seated. One in the communion of saints and in the power of the Holy Spirit, we join our voices in prayer. Glorious God, you bend down to wash the feet of your disciples. Let the servant church arise in, your, in our teaching, our praying, our healing, and our doing. Make all your faithful people powerful in weakness and strong in grace. In your mercy. Hear our prayer. Life living God, your fingers trace the heavens and your hands mold the earth. Where there is drought, bring nourishing rain. Where there is devastation from fire or flood, bring relief. Sustain the well-being of every living thing. In your mercy. Hear our prayer. Merciful God, you speak and the nations listen. Open those who govern to the cries of all who journey with no food or shelter, particularly people fleeing violence, those seeking freedom, and those in search of community. In your mercy. Hear our prayer. Gracious God, you, your embrace brings wholeness to those who are troubled. Anoint all who suffer in any way with the oil of healing and grant them renewal, especially our members, friends, and those we may name out louder in our hearts. In your mercy. Hear our prayer. <clears throat> Welcoming God, in your presence, strangers become companions and enemies become neighbors. Open our doors to those we have so easily shut out particularly people who are different from us or who are marginalized by church or society. In your mercy. Hear our prayer. Out of the gospel, we give thanks for pastors, teachers, evangelists, deacons, and ordinary lay people do, going about their daily lives who proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ by what they say and by what they do not only here in our own land, but all around the world, especially where it is difficult to do or dangerous even to succeed. As always, I pray for my dear friend and colleague, Pastor Anna Macau in Tanzania and her ministry. In your mercy. Your prayer. Eternal God, you gather us into your house of many dwelling places. We give you thanks for our faithful departed, inspire, by us, inspire us by their lives of faith until, with them, we rest forever at your journey's end. In your mercy. Hear our prayer. God, holy and merciful, into your outstretched arms we commend ourselves and all for whom we pray, trusting in the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. 
Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Let us now share a sign of God's peace with one another in whatever way works best for you. bread of life, you have set this table with your very self and called us to the feast of plenty. Gather what has been sown among us and strengthen us in this meal. Make us to be what we receive here, your body for the life of the world. Amen. Just a note. He gave thanks, and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given to you, given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink 
saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. And he taught us to pray with our hearts wide open to receive. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The meal is ready. We have regular wafers and gluten-free for some, for any of you who may need it. Please let me know if that's your choice. The table is ready. Come and eat. Thank you.
please stand for a blessing as you're able and comfortable. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Let us pray. Jesus, bread of life, you, we have received from your table more than we could ever ask. As you have nourished us in this meal, now strengthen us to love the world with your own life. In your name we pray. Amen. As you go on your way, may Christ go with you. May he go before you to show you the way. May he go behind you to encourage you, beside you to befriend you, above you to watch o'er you, within you to give you peace. The blessing of God who provides for us, feeds us, and journeys with us be upon you now and forever. Amen. Good and gracious God, we thank you for the heritage you have given us as a community of faith. Be with us in this uncertain time of the church. Send us a pastoral leader who will love you and equip us for ministry in the world. Move our hearts to a place of change. Open our hearts to hear and see your word in everything we do, every day and every moment our lives. Move us to be the church you call us to be in this time and place. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Announcements? I know that there is a, you can sit down if you want for announcements. Do you know of any, uh, if any of you know of someone who might be interested in taking the position of I think it's administrator or something like that, in the Synod office. Uh, please let that person know and have them get in touch with the Synod. Uh, the, the young woman who has been serving is moving on to other things, and that position needs to be filled. Any announcements from the parish? Oh, you're just standing. Okay. <laughs> and anybody else? Be safe, folks, in these hot days of summer, as we travel, and I wish God's blessings on all of you, and I thank you for your patience with me. I'm a little bit unfamiliar, even though I've been here many times before. It's been a while, and um, and I'm uh, so I think I buffed things a little bit, but I hope it did not distract from your worship. But I give God, give God thanks for you for strengthening my own faith, even as He has called me to speak to you and hopefully strengthen yours. So thank you. We are all in this together. Thanks be to God. And uh, let's see, our sending for song is appropriately enough. Sent forth by God's blessing, number 547. 